Good afternoon. Welcome to Sunday Sessions, uh, hosted by the Macquarie University Liberal Club, live from the Facebook main page. My name is Andrew Kremen, and joining me again in the host seat to, uh, this afternoon is James Peters. Hello. Hey, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Good to have you back on. Delayed, at least for now, is the Daniel Andrews pu uh, Public Health Amendment after a stunning block in the Victorian Upper House by Adam Somurek. What is contained in the bill and why is it so dangerous? Joining us to discuss this is Morgan Begg, Research Fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs. Morgan, welcome. Oh, you're, you're currently on mute. Oh, that's 2021 in a nutshell. No, thanks for having <laughs> me, boys. <laughs> that's good. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. Um, as always, you can post your questions in the comments section, and we'll try and pose as many of them to Morgan uh, throughout uh, the 45 minutes as we can. Um, but to start off, what powers would the Daniel Andrews Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment give to the Premier? Uh, great question. In short, uh, it's effectively uh, would confer onto the Premier, uh, the Health Minister and the authorised officers uh, a level of dictatorial power that we've never seen in Australian history. Um, it effectively, it would give the government the power to rule by decree uh, indefinitely. Um, it, on no, there is no threshold, there is no objective thresholds for the, the Premier to declare a state of emergency if the bill, uh, sorry, it's a pandemic declaration. So this is, uh, as I understand it, in addition to the existing emergency powers, these are additional pandemic management powers. Um, so as long as the Premier was merely, merely believed uh, that there was a disease of pandemic potential um, in Victoria, so not not an actual case of the disease needs to be in the state, but if there was a disease of pandemic potential, um, then the Premier could declare, uh, make a pandemic declaration, uh, which would enable the Health Minister to impose any order um, that he believed was reasonably necessary uh, to protect public health. Um, and the, the, the provisions themselves are completely broad and open-ended. Um, they could not be effectively could not be challenged in a court because there's no uh, objective standard that the health minister or the authorised officers need to meet in order to exercise those powers. Uh, it completely sidelines the role of parliament. There is no requirement uh, for the orders to be uh, approved by parliament. The, uh, the parliament has no role in uh, the, the Premier's decision to make, vary, extend um, a pandemic declaration, uh, which enables these powers to be used. Um, the powers, uh, even uh, bizarrely enough, uh, include specific provisions allowing uh, the, the Health Minister to make orders uh, that target people based on their um, characteristics uh, the prote otherwise protected in the Equal Opportunity Act. Um, so I mean, the, the probable, pur probable purpose um, is effectively to target people based on their uh, political position, say, uh, if you refuse a vaccine mandate. And uh, the, the authorised officers have um, extraordinary powers of enforcement uh, of the orders. So. These are things like uh, the abolition of the right to silence and the, the privilege against self-incrimination. Um, if an authorised officer demands or demands uh, the production of information or documents from a person, um, and they have extraordinary powers of detention. Uh, so uh, a person that was detained uh, under, under the, the, the provisions of the bill uh, would not be entitled to appear before a court uh, to assess whether their detention was uh, legal. Uh, instead, in the first instance, the authorised officer themselves reviews the detention, reviews their own detention decision. Uh, otherwise, um, beyond that, a department hack, a, a bureaucrat uh, reviews a detention. So there's no, the, the role of the courts, the role of parliament is, is the, the traditional checks and balances are like permanently uh, sidelined in the bill. So Morgan, throughout COVID, we've seen a lot of protesters um, consistently throughout a lot of the major capital cities. And more recently, we've seen thousands on thousands of Victorians in the street protesting against this bill. What do you believe their main concern, concern is? As you said, James, I mean, these are thousands upon thousands of people. And I, 
I, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for all of them, but I can, I can in my mind condense um, a lot of the concerns into some, some broad themes. Um, and the, the ones that really stand out to me is that this awareness, this, I think what people have realized, especially over the last 18 months, but especially uh, what's made clear in this bill is that things, things don't work the way that we think they're meant to work or we think they should work you know this is the idea of you know our system our government our parliamentary system is meant to be democratic um but what we've seen is that power is autocratic uh the uh, policy decisions aren't generated in parliament policy decisions are, have been outsourced to uh unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats like the chief health officer for instance um, there's there's ideas of accountability and um, a, 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 you know who do you turn to the the parliament the the premier the ministers um, you know they 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 say they're not accountable they say it's not on them um, and we've seen that you know the the decision making you know all all it's all on the science we're we're, we're told that this is all evidence based but. We're not told what the evidence is. We're not we're not shown uh, the basis for what these lockdown decisions, these decisions which are um, so drastically affecting every single one of us. Um, we've also seen that um, traditional ideas of uh, policing um, are not uh, have are not being respected or have been forgotten. Um, the idea that police you know, serve first and foremost the community. They're amongst the community and they serve the community. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's been challenged. Um, a lot of people, you know, when you see uh, police, uh, you know, going through parks and uh, you know, threatening old ladies for sitting on a park bench or, or um, you know, telling off people and fining people for, you know, not wearing their masks properly. You know, this is really confronting uh, to to the individual, and it's a, it's confronting to the idea of how the individual sees their relationship with the state, with with the government, and the idea that you know maybe maybe this shows that uh, the government's not serving us. Uh, they they're not they're not acting as public servants um, in the sense that maybe we all thought they did, um, and what. Um, why and why I'm why I'm thinking this bill makes it so much worse is because all these powers have been exercised uh, since March 2020 on the basis that we all believed that it would be temporary. Um, the Victorians accepted a lot of uh, the, the government exercise of power, these extraordinary powers, on the basis that uh well you know the state of emergency is a, is a temporary declaration there's an end date uh, you know for instance under the current legislation uh the chief health officer can't extend a state of emergency beyond the 16th of december um but what but what this bill does uh is that well no the pandemic declaration can be issued once and it can be extended by three month increments forever you know, there's there's no end date in the legislation. This this can this, you know this what has been temporary uh, will just become the the normal a, a part of our normal lives. Uh, so you know these these are massively confronting. This is you know this goes to the heart of what we believe uh, a democratic parliamentary society. Um, is uh, and it, it completely shake it completely turns it upside down. Uh, it makes uh, Victorians com it complete uh, it puts them in a state of complete subservience uh, to the government. And you know, unsurprisingly, people have reacted very strongly against that. Just following up there, you were making some um, claims about the Victorian police, especially within terms of the protest and we have seen how the Victorian police have been acting with these COVID protests specifically even with journalists like um, Avi um, Yemenai and do you think that the Victorian police are given different orders compared to their counterparts in New South Wales and Queensland when it comes to handling specific protests like the ones we've seen recently? 
Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what's happening behind the scenes with the police. Um, it does seem that uh, the, the policing, the police uh, maybe upper hierarchy the, uh, of the Victoria police seems to be more uh, politically, I'll say, motivated or motivated by uh, political connections. Um, one of the one of the more uh, graphic illustrations of this, I guess, is the uh, the the treatment of uh, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in mid last year, uh, which was essentially Victoria Police uh, agreed with the the cause, uh, and they felt that well that would be um, that wouldn't be worth. Um, Issue, you know, uh, it's, it's worth remembering that at the time there were uh, stay at home orders and restricted activities directions, uh, which were in force against um, the entirety of Melbourne. Um, but those uh, those directions weren't enforced against Black Lives Matter protesters and uh, black uh, and police leaders uh, did express at the time their, um, I suppose, their sympathies. Uh, for what Black Lives Matter uh, were saying and their, well, the reasons that they were protest marching. Um, but then, of course, you know, when it comes to people that were protesting for other reasons, maybe protesting against the policies of the government, uh, then Victoria Police were very active in restricting uh, any kind of movement in that area. So you, you know, famously saw um, you know, a, a pregnant mother uh, in Ballarat, Zoe Bueller uh, was arrested in her home uh, merely for uh, sharing a, a message on Facebook, which was about uh, the, the prospect of, that, a pro, that a protest could be happening um, against the government's directions. Uh, and so compl and completely disproportionate response, uh, arguably, I don't think there was any legal basis for the arrest. Um, and that's due to be in the courts in the next couple of months. But that just goes to show, I mean, she's over a year. Uh, she's been uh, wrangled in this uh, legal fight with Victoria Police about arrest and an arrest that I don't think ever should have happened. Um, all on the basis of this uh, inconsistent uh, attitudes in policing uh, towards the Victorian people. That's crazy. I actually, I actually didn't realise that that was still ongoing for her. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and of course the 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 COVID uh, uh, the pandemic the, the the exercise of the emergency powers has prolonged essentially the justice system. So that's you know this is it's true for uh, I suppose anyone in the courts is that their um, their justice has been delayed across the board, and that's that's true for her, uh, Bueller as well. All right. Um, the pa so the passage of the bill was thrown into jeopardy late on Wednesday night when former Labor power broker Adam Somurek indicated he would vote it down. What does this mean for the bill? Uh, it's it, uh, it's a very good sign. Um, Somurek himself has been um, he's been quite consistent in saying that he's he's not intending to change his mind about the bill. Um, and there's been no indications from the other crossbenchers. So there's a number of crossbenchers in the Victorian upper house. Um, essentially, so uh, the, the Labor Party has um, 17 members. It's a 40 member upper house. Uh, Labor has 17, I believe. Uh, and they already have the support of three crossbenchers and, you know, they need one more, uh, which is, um, you know, in itself, in and of itself, quite concerning. But there doesn't appear to be any other crossbenchers which have indicated that they'd be willing to support the government, at well, at least without a complete uh, change of approach in the bill itself. Um, so I think it's there is a there's cause for optimism that the the return of Somurek has completely derailed this. Um, Politicians are politicians, and anything could happen. Um, but you know, one observ one observation has been made uh, is that the Andrews government has been so 
um, disrespectful and uh, neglectful of those other crossbenchers because they've relied on these uh, these other three that they usually rely on. Um, that the other that you know they don't really have a relationship with those other crossbenchers in order to um, bring them around to it. So uh, I, I certainly hope those reports uh, are true, um, but we'll we'll wait and see. I'm sure that. Um, the, the government will add, will try and add in as many sitting days before um, December 16, which is when emergency powers are set to expire. Uh, they'll they'll give themselves every every opportunity, I'm sure. And um, yeah, we'll do, we'll just have to wait and see. But fingers crossed um, that none of the uh, other crossbenchers are returning. If I if I can just follow up. Um... Why are Labor supporting this at all? I mean, surely historically they would be against such a bill, no matter who would present it. Yeah, I, it's it's a good question. I, you know, why would anybody support this bill? Really, I mean, um, I, it seems that uh, I don't I don't really have a um, a strong view on internal Labor politics, but it's it's you know everything that I've seen indicates that uh, Daniel Andrews has a really strong. Uh, grip on the on the factions on the Labor Party factions. Uh, he 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 definitely has a um, an ability to get his own way uh, from the from the um, what what's it called the the parliamentary his, his party room. Um, so so I think it's it may not be so much that Labor supports this. It, it may be more that you know Daniel Andrews wants this. And Daniel Andrews gets what he wants. Um, so, Morgan, yesterday um, the Andrews government successfully moved a motion to have the debate on the bill temporarily adjourned, only two days after the Attorney General had officially declared it urgent. What do you think are their intentions with this move? It was, to me, very transparent. Um, the bill, you know, this a bill of this extraordinary nature would ordinarily uh, be considered by the upper house. It would be uh, probably sent off to a committee for an inquiry and uh, then, you know, it would take submissions from the public and then it would go through this whole process before it goes back to parliament. Uh, obviously the government didn't want to do any of that. It didn't, it didn't want to give um, parliament, it didn't want to give the upper house members a chance to really read it and go through it. Uh, it just, it was shock and awe, get it in, get it through, ram it through. Um, they thought they had the numbers. Uh, so there was the, uh, so in the upper house, there's a Greens MP, there's an Animal Justice Party MP and the Reason Party MP who are very much on board with what the government was doing. They had their support and then, uh, Somirak came back, they didn't have the numbers, and of course, and all of a sudden it wasn't so urgent. Uh, they had time to deliberate. <laughs> we, we, we do have a, um, we've got an audience question. Uh, it says, Morgan, what specific provisions in the pandemic bill do you think are violating or circumventing fundamental human rights under existing Australian laws? Gosh, I mean, there's, uh, there's definitely plenty to choose from there. I, I would, I would, I'll take this opportunity actually to recommend people, uh, recommend viewers read my most recent research report. So it's uh, Daniel Andrews' pandemic bill, uh, the attack on our democracy. Um, and this is uh, an analysis of the entire bill um, with specific notations of provisions, uh, which are uh, egregious attacks on democracy and, and our rights and freedoms. Um, I think to that questions, uh, to that particular question, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, once clause 165 AI, uh, or I may have the specific uh, number or letters wrong. No, I've got it here, I've got it here. Oh. Um, impose indefinite lockdowns even if there were no cases of the virus in the country yeah yeah so and and so this is the provision which deals with um i believe uh giving the the minister the health minister the power to issue any order 
any order, that's quote, quote from the legislation, any order uh, he believes um, is necessary to protect public health. And so it's, it's, it's in the scope of that order, uh, it's in the scope of that clause in which the health minister can do, um, can issue an order which uh, violates your um, human rights. Uh, so, and, and, that, and of course, I, I would urge uh, anyone just to uh, have a scroll through that report and you'll see uh, the, the provisions which um, remove, uh, you know, parliamentary oversight, removes um, the, the power of the courts to oversee the use of the powers or to uh, review uh, the, the, the exercise of the orders by the health minister. Morgan, normally we found bills, there might be a specific uh, section or clause in there, which has some obscure terms or wordings that a lot of people get really infuriated, but the parliament will give a reason for it. Usually it's something to do that they need to have it in there for legal reasons in case of X, Y, and Z. But the one which yourself and Andrew just read out there seems very hard to justify. Has there been any justification from the government about that specific clause? Yeah, not, not that I've heard. It, it's it's quite um, it's it feels unprecedented just how this debate, how the government's conducted themselves in this debate. There's been very little effort into justifying, and and you know it's it's not just the IPA which has pointed out uh, the, the the massive problems in this bill. These are you know senior members of the legal community, um, advocacy groups across the board, um, not aligned with any particular political persuasion, have all identified the issues with, you know, no, no par parliamentary oversight of the power, use of these powers, the, uh, the, the power to rule by decree without any, any kind of visible limitation. And, and the government has not been receptive to any of those um any of those criticisms uh it, it it always seems as if the the government's uh stock standard response is just to say that uh, opposition to this bill is extremism <laughs> well i i wonder if anyone would would uh accuse the andrews government of anti-essentialism because there because there are certain ideologies and they tend to be very popular in universities that are anti-essentialist um, and, and well, in that um, anti-West, um, but I, I wonder I wonder if someone can make um, sort of a, a good argument for that. Um, I've got another question. Uh, so, have we seen much pushback from opposition opposition leader Matthew Guy on all this? I would say that um, the the coalition led by Matthew Guy has been much stronger on this issue. Than they have been in the past, I think, and that makes sense uh, because this is, um, I think, this is an issue that obviously deserves a much stronger response. But I think one of the criticisms that has been made of the opposition up till this point is that it has not been very strong. It's um, it hasn't been in a very effective opposition um, to the Andrews government, and you know, one criticism is that it's it undermines your effectiveness to only come out really now uh, with a strong voice against the government because, you know, so much, so much of the, the foundations of this were arguably being, you know, led since uh, late in March 2020. Um, and of course, for so long, the government was able to push ahead and really um, move, move the dial so far without any opposition and, uh, and and this is where you end up if you, if you don't oppose it early on then you know the the government will just take the ball and run and this is where they've run to so dan andrews said earlier this year that lockdown sh should only be a last resort and that was also in line with the government's um roadmap where by, i think it was stage four that lockdowns weren't even to be um used as a tool but this was also coincided with the dumping of the COVID zero as a result of their high number of cases. With this new bill, does this contradict what he said earlier? Well, I think what he said earlier 
Um, I, I don't think that was very genuine. I, I think Daniel Andrews has been consistent on um, imposing lockdowns. I think it's just the, the, the people who are locked down have changed. Um, so you know, effectively what a Victoria has moved into is a two-tier society. Uh, you have the unvaccinated, which are locked down. The vaccinated uh, have been, you know, granted their freedoms as, you know, this, is, this government believes it has the power uh, to issue freedoms to people. Uh, but the, the unvaccinated are uh, forming a, um, the, 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 the sort of unfree underclass of society, which are remaining locked down. Uh, you know, they, they must still work from home. They are still limited in what they can do. So, um, no, I, I, I don't give uh, Daniel Andrews any credit for, for his earlier statement about um, using lockdowns as a last resort. I think he's still very lockdown happy and we're still in the middle of a lockdown right now. Mm. Well, now, now that the bill has several amendments uh, from the crossbench in, in, the Victorian part, in the Victorian Parliament, how does the Premier... Uh, sorry, how, how, how does the Premier actually manage to convince them in favouring the rest of the bill? So, for example, like, no, no, there have been a number of fines that were sort of absolutely extraordinary. You got sort of $90,000 for individuals if they break a public health order rule. Uh, I think it was 450000 for businesses. Like, like, that's been reduced, but there's still other problems with the bill. Like, how is it that they can get these amendments, which are good, but then support the rest of it? Uh, those, the, the three cross benches, do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I, this is my own view. I think the, the three cross benches were already very supportive of the bill. I, this is, this is just, um, uh, this is just a suspicion of mine is that what the crossbenchers wanted was the appearance of being constructive on the bill. So they've got some effectively some window dressing changes. These were very minor technical changes, not really substantive and definitely not going to the heart of what the bill represents. You know, these, these extraordinary powers to rule by, rule by decree based on the subjective views of the, the, the Premier and the Minister. Um, indefinitely the the core of the bill never changed and i don't think the crossbenchers really cared about changing them but but they just wanted to look constructive and got some very minor changes out of the government so morgan the biosecurity act has played quite a significant part into how australian states and territories have made um, broad decisions especially based on the recommendation of our chief medical officers where does the Biosecurity Act come into play with this new bill in Victoria? I don't think there's an explicit role for the Biosecurity Act in this bill. As I understand it, the, the, real, role, the real role of the Biosecurity Act is that it sort of lays the political foundations for the states to um, essentially use their powers to their fullest extent. So if there's a declaration which is made under the Biosecurity Act, then that emboldens the states uh, to, do, um, to do whatever they like, really. So and that's my understanding of how those two acts um, relate, how they um, interrelate. Uh, beyond that, I think, um, you know, definitely the use of these powers as uh, provided in the bill, uh, the exercise of these powers do not depend in any way on uh, what the federal government does under the Biosecurity Act. So maybe touching on that, uh, we've got an audience question. Would the bill have been constitutional if it passed? In the past? Um, I, I, I'm curious to know what he means by that, but... Um, uh, as an if passed. Oh, sorry, sorry, I misheard. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm sure that you could make a lot of arguments against the constitutionality of it, but one of the big, one of the realities of modern the 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 the, 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 the legal system, the, the the courts nowadays, is how deferential they are to parliaments and to the executive uh, branch of governments. 
they they appear to be very reluctant uh, to constrain governments. The the excuse or the reliance on uh, uh, powers being exercised in an emergency, uh, essentially the High Courts react to that by stepping back. Um, and we've seen there's been numerous challenges already in the courts at various levels of the court system at various states and federal levels in the High Court. Um, and they've all failed. Um, and essentially, it, it's, as I said, the courts are just very, very reluctant uh, to step in. They, they, will, they, they appear to be very reluctant uh, to assert or protect or defend uh, the rights of people against the government using emergency powers. Why is that? Uh, it's, a, it's a disturbed, it's an unfortunate tradition um, in Australian law. Um, this, and this is, it's not just uh, in public health, it's also, um, this is also in uh, the use of, say, federal government's defence power. Uh, so historically, if uh, the, the government has exercised uh, powers on the on the basis that it was for the war, say the Second World War or the First World War. Uh, there's been a tradition which has grown out of that, which is that the courts will have a more um, permissive uh, interpretation of the constitution to enable the the government to do that, even if it's not permitted by the text of the constitution. And in my view, there's been an entire tradition of um, proportionality and reasonableness analysis. So this is the idea that, well, the courts can read into the constitution extra powers for the government if it's if it's reasonable or proportionate for it to do so. This is essentially, well, if the government can justify it on some level, then it's it's permitted. Um, and uh, there's, I'm sure there's. Uh, other forces at play. This is, um, you know, the subjectiveness of, say, you know, when when we've incorporated so many subjective sources of law into Australian law. So things like international law also operates uh, using this proportionality analysis, and that I think that's really uh, embedded itself into Australian legal culture. It's our courts really really have taken this idea and run with it so that you know and essentially the courts have really they, they've been one of the checks and balances um that they're designed to be a check and balance against the executive against the the use misuse mismanagement of power extraordinary power and the courts themselves have essentially neutered themselves they've they've taken themselves out of the game uh maybe they they don't want to make a hard call maybe maybe there's other sympathies they have um but their sympathies don't appear to be uh oh, too often their their sympathies don't appear to be with the rule of law they don't appear to be with um you know traditional ideas ideals of the rights and freedoms of of the Australian people, unfortunately. So once the pandemic in Australia, and specifically Victoria, moves from being a pandemic to endemic, like we've seen, for example, in Portugal, how does this new legislation distinguish this? As I understand it, it doesn't distinguish between the two. And I don't think, um, I don't think it would stop the government in any way if, if there was uh, some determination somewhere that it was no longer a pandem pandemic, uh, because the, the health the the premier only needs to be only needs to believe that there's a disease of pandemic potential. Um, so even even if the there was no uh, presence of the case in Australia. Uh, the legislation would not stop a premier who believed there was a potential that that disease would come to Victoria as a pandemic. 
uh, from declaring, uh, from making a pandemic declaration um, and the health minister thereby able to issue any order that he wanted. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's much consideration of the ideas of endemic versus pandemic um, in the legislation. Uh, Daniel Andrews claimed that he was modelling the bill on New South Wales and New Zealand's powers, given that we recently heard that Cabinet spectacularly dropped new proposed strengthening of emergency powers up into 2023 in New South Wales. What makes the two states different in terms of their approach? I think the distinction between the two states is the, um, I suppose, the attitudes of the leaders themselves. So. Uh, I, I suspect most people would agree that in New South Wales under um, the former Premier Gladys Berejiklian and the current Premier John Perrottet is that they appear to be more reluctant to issue, to exercise the powers to, the ex to their fullest extent. Um, I, I still disagree with what's happening in New South Wales. I think um, Perrottet has... Uh, I would say has disappointed many in that he's um, uh, appears to have, to have established a, a two-tier society, uh, at least to some degree, um, between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. But uh, it, everything that's happened in New South Wales appears to be um, not like very, very uh, not not close to what uh, Victoria. Has experienced uh, the, you know, the world's longest lockdown in Melbourne, um, the complete and total isolation, extended periods of isolation uh, between um, metro and uh, rural Victoria. Uh, just so I think, um, you know, if uh, if if uh, if the New South Wales laws were replicated in Victoria, that would be uh, a terrible, uh, terrible idea. Um, I'm not surprised that uh, New South Wales, the cabinet uh, fought back on that proposal to make the, to extend the powers to 2023. I, I'm glad they did. Um, I, I think I'd be very surprised though, uh, if the powers in New South Wales were anything like they are in this bill, the, the, the level of generality um, and the permissiveness the, and the complete absence of any kind of uh, parliamentary oversight, I think, I think what is being considered is, I think the idea it, that it's merely reflecting what's happening in New South Wales now uh, is entirely disingenuous and wrong. Hmm. I, I wanted to ask before um, about, about anti-essentialist um, elements in the Labour Party, and I think I think it would extend to a number and to a number of other parties as well. Um, you know, what, what what like what exactly is the makeup of of the Labour left? Um, so sort of no, no no compared to the Labour right, in that you know as you mentioned that there's always there's always sort of generalised terms. There seems to be an attack on an, an attack on families, an attack on um, sometimes really, you know, as you mentioned, an attack on science. It's like, you know, people want to know, um, what, you know, what the health advice is. We pre most of the time we're not given, we're not given, um, sort of what it's based on. And then when it's shown to us, it's shown to be utterly inadequate. Um, so, so, so can you, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, one of the great puzzles, uh, you know, what motivates the government to, to do what it's doing. I, I think um, one of my suspicions for a long time is that as, as we've driven sort of traditional ideas of uh, religion, systems of faith out of the public square, that hasn't removed the need for systems of faith in general. And I think especially among the sort of the secular progressive left, they don't exist in a in a vacuum uh, where they where they don't need uh, they don't have those same needs. Um, I think they've identified uh, uh, this this sort of science like it's not science but it's like scientism. It's the idea of 
um, elevating um, sort of material beliefs um, a, 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 in a sort of transcendent way. Oh, we believe in the science, the science, uh, capital T, the science. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, and that opens the door to declarations of uh, heresy if you actually question the science. Uh, this isn't this isn't public. This isn't just public health. This is you, know, you can see this in the the climate change debate. Um, you know, the science is settled. The science is never settled. But um, but if uh, but if you if you're viewing it as a system uh, as a religious system, then it would uh, it absolutely is settled. You know, you can't. You can't question the science because that's like questioning uh, questioning your God. So, so I don't. I, I um. I'm I'm not as well versed in uh, anti essentialism. You you. I might you might need to expand on that. That's, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> well, well, I I, I guess I, I was actually um. I did a whole episode on on cultural Marxism. We did that um quite a while back. Um. You know, I I had a, I had a textbook in my undergrad. Um. It, it wasn't at this wasn't at this uni. Um, that mentioned that you no know, you know, critical theory is is anti essentialist. It does not believe in um, uh, it, it does not believe in such a thing as human nature. That's a myth. Um, uh, politics is pervasive. That's sort of the, it's the dominant worldview. And, and right now we're having trouble seeing things outside of a political lens. Um, there's a whole bunch of other sort of basics as well. And I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, I wouldn't say it's exclusive to the left, but I'm seeing it a lot. And it all and it all comes from dare, like dare I say it, it's it, it's co it's coherent onto itself. It, it's anti essentialist, so in a sense it's incoherent, mm -hmm. but it's consistent with its own beliefs. So I, I I did a whole episode on it. You mentioned though with the science, um, like so the the basis of science is not whether you can prove something, but whether um, whether it cannot be disproven. Mm -hmm. So the idea of science, like I had this described to me by a doctor, is that you know Einstein's theory of rel relativity is so good not because he proved it. But because no one could disprove it, mm. and so it is with contentious issues in regards to science, is that well, there, there seem to be a number of holes um, in the science, and so you know, traditionally speaking, you know, you would simply just explore them further yeah. rather than uh, rather than try and deny people um, uh, their point of view. Um, I, sorry, I think James James has got a um, he's got an audience question. Yes, well, we spoke about this prior to the show starting in relation to Dan Andrews' polling numbers. And just looking at the latest news poll and Roy Morgan numbers, the Labor Party is uh, sitting around 58% on the two-party preferred, which is up since when Matthew Guy became the Liberal leader and leader of the opposition. And Dan Andrews is also sitting on a 54% better Premier and 56% satisfaction rate. Despite all that's going wrong with this passage of the bill and extreme COVID restrictions within Victoria, do you see there being any proper backlash that will be able to see change the next Victorian election? That's a good question. I, uh, I've, you know, maybe I'm not the right person to ask this because I've been expecting a backlash for some time now and I've been, uh, if the polls are to be believed, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not right in that, but, um, you know, obviously, uh, may uh, a, an argument could be made that the poll, if the, the polls are correct, um, and that what we're seeing this uh, the the passionate backlash against the government is among people who already may not have voted for the government. But I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of uh, the government has weaponized this uh, this whole situation, the pandemic. Uh, very well to its own benefit. It's acted without an effective opposition for a long time. Um, the effect, uh, essentially, uh, the, the the coalition has really, um, I would say, become a more prominent um, opposition. It's become a more effective opposition only very recently. Uh, I suspect, in my experience, that that sort of thing will take time uh, to translate into polls. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, the sad thing is that um, Daniel Andrews is just, uh, he's a very canny politician. He's very, 
very talented at getting his own way, at um, at uh, utilizing events uh, to his benefit, and he's done that very successfully. Um, he's uh, he's been very well assisted by uh, by the the media, uh, a journalistic class which I feel has massively degraded uh, and and proven how degraded it is. Um, there's been very, very little scrutiny, um, not enough scrutiny um, when it counts, when it's counted. So uh, all of these forces combined, uh, they mean they, they bode very well for Daniel Andrews. Uh, but, you know, if this bill, if this bill continues to be a thorn, uh, in his back, if it if it continues to be a problem and he may be not able to pass it, then and he cops a big loss, uh, then you know we may see sentiment change. It maybe maybe all it takes is one big loss um, for the numbers to start moving again. We'll, as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. And very very quickly, an audience question: If it's so bad, where is the governor? This is this is a very good point, and unfortunately. Um, one of the one of the, the sad realities of uh, the dismissal of God, this, is, this is going back a long way to explain what's happening now. But uh, once upon a time, I would say that uh, the a, a governor would have stepped in. Um, but one of the the bad big side effects of the uh, the dismissal of Gough Whitlam in 1975, and the level of appro opprobrium which was directed at Sir John Kerr. Uh, for dismissing uh, Gough Whitlam is that essentially there's been a, a silent agreement since then is that governors and, govern and governors general are stepping back. You know, that, that they'll never do that again. Uh, so that means they'll never intervene. They'll never do, um, they'll never essentially protect. They'll, you know, the idea that uh, the vice regal would be the last resort. The the, the last line of defence uh, has effectively been wiped away. So, um, I I absolutely there's been various times um, where I've felt that it would be completely justified for the governor to step in and say, no, this is this is too far. This is no no. I, I, as the governor, don't serve you. I serve the Queen uh, and through the Queen, the Victorian people. Um, but that that hasn't happened. It won't happen. Um, it's until, you know, I, I don't know what, what could fix that, really. Um, I'm, that's just an unfortunate reality of Australian politics, it seems. Well, hopefully some of those silent traditions that we've, um, that we've talked about can be reconsidered. Um, yes. We are out of time. Morgan Beck, thank you so much for coming on to talk with us. Uh, this this bill is it's it's absolutely insane. So thank you so much for um, for talking with us. No, thanks for having me. It was great. All right, this has been Sunday sessions with the with the Macquarie University Liberal Club. I'm Andrew Cummins, and this and James Peters has been joining me once again. Uh, we will see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>